This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Flames fans, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of Fireside Chat. This one was actually recorded live on location at Windsport back in July when the Flames held their rookie development camp. We thought we'd release it to you now so you can get a little bit of an idea of some of the guys in the system as the Flames prepare for their main camp. It might sound a little bit different than usual, but enjoy the show. We are here live at Windsport for On Ice Day 1 of the Flames Rookie Development Camp 2017. As usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we have a special guest today. We have Michael Gold joining us again. He joined us earlier in the season for one episode. So, Mike, thanks for joining us to help us break down Day 1 of camp. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So it's an interesting camp this year. Less players than we've seen in the past. We have two teams. We have Team Jelena, Team Connor. I think in the past we had like Team McDonald as well. Yeah, sometimes four teams. So it's a little bit of a different take on things. And a lot more, I'd say, players looking for a job. We've seen this organization doing quite well in bringing players in who don't have a job, who are free agents, and then getting them either on an AHL deal or into the ECHL or even an NHL deal. I mean, we've seen that with guys like, you know, Ryan Lomberg's come that way. Hathaway's come that way. Sure, even guys like Josh Juris. Before. Josh Juris. So I think that it, you know, whether they're college free agents or overage uh, Canadian players, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for these kids. Yeah, and in years gone by, the, the Flames have had plenty of draft picks, and when you have several years of that, the development camps are going to be larger because you just have more people. But now the Flames are graduating people out, so now. It's more focusing on trying new people out and seeing what you have. You look, this isn't going to change either because next year the Flames only have three draft picks. That the, the thing that makes this uh, development camp a little bit more interesting to watch and the reason that a lot more people should come out and watch is because there's a lot more new faces to see, guys who you haven't recognized. We even had Spencer Fu here last year and he's really blossomed to do a way better player. So. It's really interesting to watch. And I think if nothing else, it's almost a PR thing. You know, we brought Spencer Fu in last year. He gets to see the Flames organization. He gets to see the city. He gets to be treated really well. And I think when you go to then sign those guys, they know what to expect from this organization. Um, looking at the young players, as Mike said, we had uh, Spencer Fu here. We had all the draft picks from this year. Valamaki is here. Um, D'Artagnan Jolie, probably the best Flames prospect name this year. And some of the older guys. Hunter Smith is back. Um, we did see Emil Poirier here this year, which is good. After what happened to him last year, it's good to get him back on the ice. And we're also, I'd say the more senior guys are uh, Oliver Shillington, Adam Olis Matson, and Rasmus Anderson are all here as well. Yeah, it's good to see some familiar faces, but mostly it's new players or guys that are just returning for, like, Matthew Phillips. This is his second go-around. It's nice nice to see a, a mix of all different levels, especially so it helps the younger guys see what, like, a player like Poirier, what he's at. Like, okay, I have to do this, this, and that in order to reach his level. So, guys, let's talk a little bit about what we saw today. Um, First, at 9 o'clock this morning, we had what's called Team Conroy on the ice. And you guys can get these rosters from CalgaryFlames.com if you want to know who is on what team. But this was a team that included uh, Poirier, Pollock, um, Tutuola, Fox, Shillington, and both of the, I'd say, bigger goalies of Parsons and Schneider were on this team. Matt, you and I were here right from the beginning of this one. Any thoughts on this group? Uh, I I thought that Emile Poirier had was probably the best of the forwards, which makes sense because uh, this is I think his fourth go around at this event. Uh, for the walk-ons, there was two players that stood out: uh, Jeff Mallett, number seventy-eight, and Gled Godin, uh, number eighty. Uh, both just had some skill and reasonable overall play those would be the two walk-on forwards to watch uh tyler parsons looks like he's ready to go (laughs) parsons even has flames colored pads now so you know the kid's ready to turn pro 
Yeah, he was he was really really impressive from the little that I saw of him. Like I I I got here with about 30 or 40 minutes left in the session and he made about four or five really show-stopping saves that were very very impressive. Uh, in terms of forwards, uh, Aitu Tulola, who had a really really promising showing last year, was pretty good out there. Um, uh, Brett Pollock, who the Flames acquired in the uh, Chris Russell trade with Dallas a few years ago, though, uh, was sort of a little bit on the other side of the spectrum. He wasn't quite as impressive, and I think a, a player, a former Edmonton Oil King, who a lot of fans were sort of intrigued by a couple of years ago, he he has a lot more to show, that I think. But Dylan Dubé, especially, another guy who was in Team Conroy, was, was very, very impressive, and he'll probably make it back to the World Juniors again this year. I really liked what we saw from Godden. He's a St. Louis Blues draft pick who wasn't signed. Um... I thought that he played well out there. He looked like, often when we come to these camps, we see there's a separation between Flames prospects and walk-on guys. And if I didn't know who was a Flames prospect, I would have assumed that he was drafted and part of this organization. He fit in really well there in the forward group. Yeah, and same with Mallet. I think he also separated himself from the rest of the walk-on group just with some skills, some speed, some hands. None of the walk-on players are ever a complete package, but there was enough there that it, he showed himself to be someone to keep an eye on. No, we have to remember that today was all practice-type drills, right? Today we saw them doing their drills, doing their shooting. Really, for me, where we get to evaluate these guys on Friday in the game situation of that scrimmage. And we'll sometimes see guys that look really good in the practice not show up well in the scrimmage, or vice versa. We've had guys that have looked terrible in practice yeah like and they've shown a few years ago was absolutely horrible in the practice session yet scored two goals in the scrimmage so yeah. and i mean we know that depends on who you play with what's going on there a lot of things but to me that's where we really evaluate these guys um on the defensive side of team conroy i thought that you know my overall assessment of this team, but I think especially on the defense, was nobody did anything they shouldn't have been doing. The guys that should have been at the top, like the Poiriers, the Shillingtons, they were looking the way they needed to. They looked like guys who had, you know, pro experience. The guys that were walk-ons looked about what they needed to. And the new draft picks, I mean, you know, Valamaki looked good. All these younger guys were looking good today. But yeah. especially on the defensive side, I was noticing Shillington making less mistakes than a lot of guys. And I think... I don't want to say taking things more seriously, but really running the drills at a bit of a different intensity than some of the other defensemen like uh, Fox, like Rupp. Um, you know, you could just tell that he was used to the pace of play and practice at the American League level. Yeah, and the newest flame, Yusuf Valenaki, looked very composed defensively in the drills. He wasn't getting caught flat-footed or anything like that. You're so good. <laughs> That's really lame. Um, no, he was. And, and, I mean, he looks like a first-round pick. You know, this is a guy who – and, you know, we will talk more about this on future episodes, and I imagine as we go forward throughout the summer and into training camp. But I think Yusuf's a guy very much like Jankowski is a few years away. He's not getting drafted, and he's going to be in the NHL right away. This is a, a bit of a project first-round guy, and you can tell that he needs a little bit of seasoning. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, he's not going to be a guy like Kachuk who's just going to go straight into the lineup. Although I will say that last year Kachuk wasn't nearly as seasoned uh, at development camp as he was in the season. But um, with Valamaki, he was making all the right plays out there, the plays that he should have made. But I wouldn't expect to see him in on the Flames or like come even really close to making the Flames this year. But there's such a a big depth chart on D. Yeah, like uh, and he's a left shot, right? I mean, I'm pretty I believe sure, so. I'm pretty sure he is. So. Uh, you, you so I mean he's behind a bunch of guys in the depth chart like Brett Kulak and uh, and uh, even Shillington and so I, I I would actually not be surprised to see Shillington maybe even uh, make the jump this year if if he has a really good camp but there's a lot to be excited with Valimaki he's a really good defenseman he's really conservative he's he makes all the right plays on the back end he doesn't do anything to make him stand out in a bad way he's a really exciting prospect Matt what were your initial thoughts very much the same uh, he just looked solid out there and he's a very tall defenseman compared to some of the other prospects the Flames have and he looks like he will be an NHL player it's just not right this minute any other defensemen on uh, Team Conroy you guys want to particularly call out Adam Fox looked okay like I didn't he wasn't 
Fox, I uh, think, again, looked where he should be looking yeah, at his development curve. A guy who's coming out of college, you know, he didn't get lost out there, but he definitely wasn't the best defenseman on the ice. No. He was uh, a little bit better than he was last year at the development camp, but not, like, super, like, three or four steps better. So let's move to the, the men in the crease for this team. We saw uh, Tyler Parsons and Nick Schneider. Nick Schneider, as fans might remember, was recently moved in the Western Hockey League. He got acquired by the Hitmen. So we'll be seeing a lot more of him in Calgary. But uh, from Tyler Parsons, he played for both Team Conroy and Team Jelena today. They, they must have made some sort of trade in the dressing room. Um, for a conditional seventh-round pick, just like our last goalie trade. But... Would you guys agree that Parsons probably looks like he's ready to turn pro? He's not NHL ready, but do you think this guy's ready to graduate to, let's say, the ECHL level? Absolutely. Tyler Parsons was a, put in a really, really terrific showing out there today. He, was, he, was, he had really good positioning. He was staying with guys really well. And once, I mean, on the very rare occasion that he did get beat, he would sort of turn into Marc-Andre Fleury and make a really good desperation play. I saw one uh, where Hunter Smith was coming down on him and uh, – and he sort of made a move and got him a bit out of position, and Parsons just stuck his leg up in the air, and uh, and he managed to get a toe on it. I mean, he was he was he was really really confident in his crease. He was really really uh, he was prepared to make any mean any uh, crazy move necessary to make a save, and it was really quite encouraging to see. Well, also uh, that uh, move that Jonathan Quick made last year where he made that kick save where he like had his pad about six, eight inches off the yeah, ice. Yeah. Uh, Parsons made four or five of those today. It was actually quite interesting to see him practicing that particular move. Well, and that's the thing too at these kind of camps is I sometimes wonder how much is that's needed to save the puck and how much of that is, you know what, let's do something cool to show the coaches that I'm ready for this level. Yeah, true enough. Uh, you might as well, like, if you have the ability to do it, why not show off a bit? Because that does nothing but impress the coaching staff of, hey, this guy's showing this much confidence that I can go and do these Until things. you tear a muscle and now you don't play in this season. <laughs> um, and on the other side of the ice from him this morning at 9 o'clock was number 70, Nick Schneider. I don't know about you guys. Schneider looked to me like a. I mean, we have we have lots of depth in this crease. We've got what seven goaltenders in the system now. Um, so I think that if you look around at the goaltending and you know where Schneider fits into that picture, I think that Schneider honestly may be the odd man out here. I don't see this guy turning pro with the Calgary Flames organization and us getting much mileage out of him. What are your thoughts? Schneider's always been a little bit of an afterthought for me, to be totally honest. Uh, when they first brought him in a couple of years ago, I didn't really think much of him. Uh, he was impressive last year, but this year he sort of reminded me a little bit of what David Riddich looked like at development camp last year. Uh, pretty unspectacular, just sort of sort of there in the crease. I think the I, biggest thing for Riddich, too, is he was getting used to that North American right, game. I mean, yeah. if you look at his AHL season, when he got used to the North American game, he looked great. And I mean, Schneider's still fairly young. I mean, he was in the Western Hockey League last year, so... He obviously has a lot of rope still left to left to climb in this organization, but I, I think in the long term view, I mean, how many goalies can the Flames really carry? I mean, there's there's three teams in the organization. There's the Flames, the Stockton Heat, and the Kansas City Mavericks, and so they have Gillies, they have Parsons, they have Riddich, they have McDonald, and they have Schneider, uh, who aren't in the NHL, and they have Smith and the Lack who are. And I think you can you can have six goalies pretty much playing full time, and then if you have a seventh like they had with Tom McCollum last year, you're not going to really find him a crease. So I think it'd really be in the best interest of the Flames to find Nick Schneider a crease, and I don't think that's going to be inside the Flames organization. All your goalies are belong to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, I mean, if you look at it too, guys, we've given up how many draft picks over the last week, or even you know two weeks here. If you really look at it as a business asset. Do you think that Schneider could potentially be moved for a late round pick, and that we need? No. I, I think conditional I think, seventh. I think that Schneider could maybe like, in a best case scenario, that he could be moved for a similar right wing prospect, but I don't know how many of those exist. A similar prospect to a goalie? Well, no, but like you know, I mean, in similar terms of his, level. Okay. In terms of his organizational uh, stature, like uh, just because the Flames are so weak on the right side that I think. It, uh, that's really the only trade that they could make. Cause yeah, I, don't so I was curious, Mike. Getting, I thought we'd have a right winger with a blocker and a trapper. Yeah. And, well, basically getting like a Brett Pollock type. 
prospect. Well, yeah, and that's honestly where I think eventually Schneider will land is he'll be thrown in with some deal somewhere to, to even things out. And with goalies, it never hurts to just, you know, he will be playing in the dub, I think, again this year. So it doesn't hurt just to park him there and see. Because if he turns it on, maybe there might be something there. But it's no harm, basically. Yeah, way. I think it's pretty much guaranteed he'll be in the dub. You don't have the hitman make a trade for an overage goaltender and then not use him. So, um, Should we move on to Team Jelena? Yes. Interesting names for these teams. Conroy and Jelena. It's not even two coaches. It's just two alumni guys in the organization. Um, but, yeah. So this was a team. This was the second team this morning. They hit the ice at 1030. And this team contained names you guys will probably know, like Spencer Fu, D'Artagnan, Joe Lee, uh, Linus Lindstrom, on Andrew Mangiapani, Matthew Phillips, uh, Hunter Smith, and then on defense we had Anderson uh, and Matson. Really, is the two big defensemen there, as lo- as well as uh, Mace McDonald in net. So let's talk about the forwards here. I think the first guy everyone's wondering about is Spencer Fu. Fu was here last year unsigned. He's now signed as a Flames prospect. Some fans I know think this kid should make it to the NHL this year. I think some people think he's challenging there. First thoughts, do you think he's challenging for an NHL spot? No. I think he's a good quality prospect, but I would not expect him to be in the starting lineup. I think he needs at least a half season, if not a full year in Stockton, just in order to learn the pro game. Uh, You can see that there's skill there, but it's just not a finished product. What about you, Mike? Well, with Spencer Fu, what I saw out there today was probably the most engaged prospect like, you, you would always hear him shouting up the ice to get a pass, or you would always see him jostling for position well and, and really making a bunch of great pl- plays and making himself be noticed. At the same time, though, I still don't see him making, uh, making the flames this year. I think there's too much of a logjam on, on, uh, at the wings with guys like Brower and Froelich and Lazar and, and Versteeg and... And I don't think he has enough organizational uh, uh, merit to make the team over those guys. I think he just needs another season of seasoning. And I don't think he's good. He could surprise maybe like a jurist, but at, at the end of the day, I don't really see it. And I don't know about you guys. I think that's almost good. When you have a spot open and you're saying somebody's going to get this, it becomes like a bad reality show, right? 16 forwards will come to camp. One will wear a flaming C. But if, there's, if we don't have that open spot, if we say, you know what, if you're better than this guy, you take a spot. If you're not, you don't. It lets these guys develop on their own timeline, I think, instead of like, oh, we need to rush somebody in. You there, you know, you happen to be a right winger. Come join the yeah, NHL. Yeah, that was sort of the problem in the second year, uh, like after the Flames made the playoffs against Vancouver, the year after like all of the spots were already entrenched and nobody had an opportunity to actually crack the lineup. And that kind of led to a lack of enthusiasm, I think, from a lot of players in the organization. And the Flames struggled accordingly, and, well, they missed the playoffs, which ended up being all right getting Matthew Kachuk. But, you know, I, I think having that just internal competition will help spring things forward. I think, again. too. I mean, Spencer Fu is a college free agent. This team has had some rough luck with college free agents lately. Guys like Bryce Van Braberent, guys like Kenny Morrison. We've brought in a lot of these college free agents that haven't yeah. turned out. Brady Lamb. And guys that, you know, are barely cutting it at the AHL level, much less the NHL level. So I think more than maybe the Canadian League, the guys who play in the Western Hockey League, the Quebec Major Junior, or the Ontario League, I think those guys need more seasoning. I think I would want to take that college player and park them in the A or the ECHL for at least a year. Yeah, unless they were a star caliber NCAA player, then perhaps you could slot them in the NHL like uh, Vessi or even Drake Kajula. But those guys are few and far between, and Fu is not on that level as of right now. And I think one thing to remember, too, when we're here is we're seeing, you know, 18-year-olds against 18-year-olds. We're seeing 18-year-olds against 19-year-olds. So Spencer Fu might look great in the scrimmage playing against his contemporaries, but when we get to September and he's playing in NHL games against guys in their 20s and 30s, that's really the test of how good this guy is. Yeah, like that's part of, like, 
Emile Poirier looks fantastic in this camp, but he's, he's the also, oldest guy here. Yeah, and if he wasn't the best guy, then there's significant. I, I like that he's the oldest guy here, and he's grown like a full beard. It's not Hunter Smith caliber, but you know, it's like he wants to can. show everybody he's the older man here. Get off my stall, you damn kids! Um, any other forwards? You know, Spencer Fu. I knew a lot of people would want to talk about. To me, again on this team, everyone looked the way they should have. Mangiapane stood out to me, but he's one of the older guys. He needs to. Um, Linus Lindstrom. He uh, wasn't really thought of too highly. He was a fourth round pick last year. Just he didn't seem like there was any, much to get hyped about like say with Matthew Phillips but in this camp he actually was quite dynamic made quite a few interesting plays and set a few plays up that were unusual and required a lot more high level thinking and skill Lindstrom's been playing in Europe though and I think that that's one of those things where you can tell the guys who've played in higher level leagues versus you know, Canadian Junior Leagues. Now, there's anything wrong with the Canadian Junior Leagues, but when you're playing in the Swedish Elite Leagues, the Russian Leagues, those sort of things, I think there's a different level of skill that's required there that you bring into these kind of camps. Uh, for me, there were three guys who I sort of want to talk about. The first one was Matthew Phillips, who was just incredible out there. He was really, like, if, if he was, I feel like if he was maybe, like, six inches taller, he would be by far the best prospect the Flames have, but... Even but still, isn't that he, how you say with every prospect? Uh, if only well, this yeah. guy if, had this if, thing. If, if he, if, yeah, if, yeah. If only but, Keegan Kanzik could skate. Yeah, well, really. But, but, but even, even still, without being as tall or whatever, Matthew Phillips is still one of the best prospects in the Flames organization. And I think this organization, too, has proven that we can take those smaller guys and you know, use them. Right, put them right into high-impact high, uh, high impact spots and have them ma make a high impact. Uh, Phillips was making a bunch of really incredible plays out there. He was uh, he was able to beat Parsons, which was on multiple multiple occasions, uh, making just incredible moves. He's really shifty, really crafty, and we saw that last year too. Um, in terms of walk-ons, uh, Sebastian Vidmar made a really good impression with me. Uh, he he was just he had a really good nose for the net. He was making a lot of good plays. Uh, uh, playing really physically in their little scrimmage, uh, it, it was quite impressive. And then Hunter Smith, uh, you know, uh, he Hunter Smith has always been sort of an interesting prospect for me because I just I thought he was drafted like three rounds too high at the time, and I've, I've always still thought that. But but he was he looked very composed out there, and he 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 had a few good shots, and he was he was playing physically. He just didn't look engaged or wasn't he? I mean, he wasn't very fast. So. I think got to give Smith a bit of a break too because he's been injured he's, he's for a while. Injured, so yeah. I don't know how long, how long since he's been on the ice but, last. But I, I I I will say I did see something in him today. He was just he was there was something about him that just made him look good aesthetically. He was getting decent chances and he was converting on some of them. I wouldn't write him off quite yet. Well, I think that Smith, if nothing else, he's got a bit of grit to his game. And I think, you know, he'll probably be one of these guys that's around the organization maybe for longer than some fans would like him to be just because he's a good kid. He can play his game. He's not going to be your next Goudreau or Monaghan, but he's a good AHL hand. Yeah, and the Flames are keeping on the pipeline, getting guys like Zach Fisher and Austin Carroll, Hunter Smith, all that same rugged physical guy who has some skill not bad overall and uh, just to carry on uh, with what uh, Mike was saying about Matthew Phillips I think that with his speed and tenacity around the net and the quickness of his hands I wouldn't be shocked if he down the road became the Flames version of Jake Gensel just a very good secondary scorer that has that nose for the net and can pop goals in so now he's got to find him two other line mates. We've got to find his uh, Monaghan and his Furland. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say uh, to any Flames fans out there, Matthew Phillips, I, I, I would just make a bold prediction. He will be the next Johnny Goudreau. So this is coming from the guy who bought a, a David Jones jersey. You're going to go and get yourself a 47 Matthew Phillips jersey? Yeah, I'll just have a great, great chance to replay my Berchie, you know? I, I don't actually own a Berchie jersey. It's just, you, know. you, you go and buy one of last year's jerseys for cheap. Yeah. Buy some of those sticky numbers at the dollar store and come out tomorrow with your own jersey. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that'll be a great, that'll be a hit at the Saddle Dome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you find one of those crappy, you know, Costco jerseys that have the wrong striping pattern, you can get that and put his name on it. Um, any other Fords you guys want to talk about before we move to the blue one? 
Uh, Andrew Mangiapane, he looked very good. Him and Fu were... Uh, him, Fu, and Phillips were the three best offensive forwards. And Mangiapane's three, the guy on this team with the most pro experience, too. Yeah, and all three looked great. And he didn't do anything to disappoint. No, I think he still needs a little bit of seasoning before I look at him as an NHL caliber guy, but I can see Mangiapane. Every year we see him improve at these camps, and I could see him eventually being a bottom six forward for the Flames. I, yeah, I agree with that. So let's look at the defense here. The defensive core for Team Jelena was Rasmus Anderson, Josh Healy, Connor Mackey, Adam Olus Matson, Mitch Ranky, and Nick Wolf. Many of these names not signed by the Flames. And why don't we start with Mike? You'd made a comment pretty much as soon as this team hit the ice that seemed to you like Rasmus Anderson had better conditioning this year than last year. Last year, Rasmus Anderson was just he he wasn't very fast. He didn't seem all that engaged, and he was he was he was really just out of shape. But this year, he's slimmed up really well. He's obviously been in the gym a lot, and he looked really, really, really good. Like, he was he was uh, playing really well. He had really nice outlet passes, uh, playing physically. He was even sort of fired up. I, I noticed there were a few times where just waiting for drills to get started, he was, like, jostling around with his teammates, putting a little... He, he uh, took a few swings at Andrew Mangiapane, uh, getting ready for a drill to start. He just seemed really impressive. I mean, he was just very fired up and engaged, and I'm really excited to see what he could do next year. Matt, how much of that do you think has to do with him now being a pro? Well, exactly, and he's also trying to fight for that same spot that Brett Kulak is kind of inherited. And if you remember, he actually finished the season as a Flame. If you go to their website right now, he's listed as a member of the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and he wants to take that next step, and between him, Bartkowski, and Kulak, those are the three guys fighting for the one spot. The number six and spot, essentially. He wants it, so he's fighting for it, and he's engaged. And that's one of the concerns with Anderson was, is he going to ever be engaged? And he is, so that bodes well for the Flames. And I think if he would have come back to this camp out of shape and not looking like he was ready, especially to jump to the NHL, I think you'd immediately start looking at Shillington or other guys for that role. I think he needed to do that. And I think being in Stockton and being around a pro atmosphere now, he's going to be able to keep that you know level of engagement, level of conditioning up. I just think that the one thing that's, uh, that might hinder Anderson's chances to make the Flames next year is that we know how much Gulletson loves putting a left-handed defenseman with a right-handed defenseman. And right now, the Flames have uh, Dougie Hamilton, TJ Brody, and Michael Stone, all of whom are RHDs at the NHL level. And I, I suppose that maybe Anderson will stick around as the number seven defenseman, but I really, I, I think that the Flames will keep Bartkowski around to do that. So unless uh, Gulletson wants to put uh, Anderson with Stone, I, I, I'm not sure if, if he'll do that, but who knows? Maybe he really, really impresses it. Well, Matt, you had some great thoughts on that earlier. Why don't you share with everyone what your thoughts were on, I think you thought that, you know, this would be the kid we call up if there's an injury. Yeah, it, realistically, uh, with the cap situation, Bartkowski makes sense to have as your number seven defenseman because you're not going to play him on, you know, unless a, a guy gets banged up a little bit and just can't go or someone's really struggling for a bit and just needs a break. But you're not going to play Barkowski for more than a game or two in a row. So if any of the top five guys get hurt for any length of time, I think Anderson's going to be the first recall, and he'll play for in whichever role suits. And the fact that we are so deep on the blue line, even if you bring Anderson up, he can still get pretty sheltered minutes. You know, if Stone were to slot into a top four because of an injury, now you bring in a you know Kulak. Anderson for third pairing, you can still bring him up, make him look good, and play him in fairly sheltered minutes. Not like this guy has to come in and try to take Giordano minutes or you know fit into a top two pairing somewhere. So I think that's probably pretty reasonable. Um, Adam Olus Matson, I saw again. Not uh, he looked like one of the more senior guys here. This is a guy who's played some some men's hockey. But to me, you know, didn't stand out. But o Olus Matson, I don't think is a guy who is ever going to stand out. He's a defenseman who's there. He knows how to do his job. He's more of a defensive guy. And, you know, I think that he did his job well, but he's not someone people are going to leave here today talking about number 68. I could see Adam, Adam Wallace Matson being an NHL defenseman, but I'm not sure if that'll be with the Flames. But he looked really composed out there, looked really mature, um, and he had a nice outlet pass, good skating, even especially for a, a guy as tall as he is. So he, he's a good prospect to watch out for. Uh, 
I could see him topping out as like a six seven guy. I don't see him having any offense to his game to warrant it being placed in the lineup any higher than that. And he'll still have to take a couple of steps in order to get to that point. Yeah, I think with Olus Matson for me, I really want to see this guy um, with more North American play. Yeah. You know, it's. I think that it's going to be tough to judge him until he's really got some North American hockey under his belt. Um, last on Team Jelena, Mason McDonald, the goaltender here. Um, only one goalie on this team, so they stuck Parsons back out there. I'm going to go with an unpopular opinion amongst Flames fans. Okay. I think that Mason McDonald will one day be an NHL goaltender. What? Yeah. It, his type and style of goaltender usually takes a little bit longer to sort itself out. And the guy that I, I recognize him a lot as stylistically is Steve Mason. And it took Steve Mason until he was 26 or 27 to figure things out. And similarly, Mason McDonald was highly rated. He could be your next Tim Thomas. And he looks more composed. He looks stylistically a little bit better. He's not like last year he was having difficulty catching the puck. He didn't have that problem. Well, I think you can tell he's had a year of pro hockey under his belt. Yeah, and it's one of those things that with goalies, some guys are like Parsons. You can tell right away that this guy's good, and he will be in the NHL at some point. Other guys, it's a work in progress, and McDonald seems to be a work in progress, but there's enough there that I think – I don't expect McDonald to be a starter in the NHL. But there's enough there where I think he could be a serviceable backup with the potential of more. If Laurent Brassois can be a backup for a season, I don't see why Mason McDonald can't. Yeah, and I'm not saying like right now, uh, probably like two, three, four years down the road. Matt, I can agree with you on that, but I don't think it's going to be in the Calgary Flames no, organization. No, neither I think if do we, I. If we look at the goalies in the depth chart, he's going to be the odd man out as oh, of next for year. Sure. Yeah, for sure. It's just one of those things that there is that potential there. Yeah. It's, and that does become a viable trading chip down the road, but especially if Parsons and Gillies say, like in two years once Smith's contract is up, if those two guys are the starter and the backup, well, that, and they're doing a good job, you're obviously not going to need anybody else. So I think going into last season, McDonald's outlook here looked better. I don't think anyone expected Riddich to be any good. He was just kind of brought in to be there and to push Gillies. And at times he looked better than Gillies during the AHL year. So I think he's taken that sort of role that was earmarked for Mason as the AHL backup this year. And so, yeah, I think Mason's going to be serviceable. Where he plays, to me, is going to be the interesting part. Do we run two goalies in the ECHL? Do we loan him out to somebody? Or do they try to move him before the season starts? And I think that's going to be the interesting thing to find out what happens to Mason. I can't see him playing in Kansas. I think Kansas City's starting job goes to Parsons. And I don't really want Mason McDonald playing a backup role in the ECHL. No, and I think that the Flames will have to find somewhere for him to get game action and there are opportunities for There's him. some independent ECHL teams that probably take him. Yeah, it, it's just that there is prospect potential there. It's not like he's a flamed-out prospect three years post-draft and like you're just waiting for the entry-level contract to burn out so that way you don't have to have him in your organization anymore. It's just now with the unexpected play of Riddich, it kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in things, but it's one of those things that's a good problem to have. Oh, gee, we have too many good goalies. (laughs) So I think that's about it for today. Anything else you guys want to kind of sum up about day one of On Ice Camp? Josh Healy didn't blow any kids up, so... uh, uh, That was disappointing. Yeah, so, I mean, you know... uh, yeah. I would imagine coaching staff has told them these are business assets for us. Please don't take them out if that's what you want. There's lots of kids at Winsport training camps. Yeah, yeah. So, no. Um, to to be serious, I I think uh, it this isn't as uh, this isn't as a high profile a camp as ones in years past have been. Like when there have been the big names like Kachuk or Monahan or Goudreau, but 
you look at uh, at the guys who are here and it's it's actually a lot more fun I think because with the guys like Kachuk or Monahan or Goudreau you know that there's a lot to expect but with these guys you get there's a lot more surprise potential and I was really surprised by some of these guys today it was it was a lot more engaging for me because I was able to look at these guys and analyze these their games without having any influence of well they were drafted really high so of course they're going to be good so I, I encourage a lot more people to come out because it, especially for the scrimmage on Friday, because it's just really fun. There's a lot of cool Flames fans here, and it's a very fun event to come to. Mike, on that note, I think this is more what we're going to see for the next number of years. If if the Flames are in this contender mode, and we've traded away a lot of our draft picks, we're relying on a veteran, more veteran-laden squad to get us deeper in the playoffs. I think every year there's going to be less and less known commodities coming to these camps. So it is going to be more about, I think, finding the diamonds in the rough, bringing in those late round picks, bringing in those walk-on guys and seeing who we can convert to something. So I think it's going to be more of a, a treasure hunter's camp to, you know, yeah, you can come and of, say, oh, I saw that guy, Glenn Godden, before he was signed. Yeah, sort of like the years when the Flames, after their Stanley Cup run in 04, where like the best guys were Eric Nystrom, Dustin Boyd, and uh, David Moss, and everybody else is like, who's that? It's more of a situation where like there is no high-profile guys that stand out as a clear tier above everybody else. So it's more interesting to see, and it's more of an opportunity for these walk-on players because. If you just stand out as being as good as any of the established guys here, then you're going to get a spot because of that, that fact. I would imagine there'll probably be two, maybe three of these guys that we'll see back in the Penticton tournament who yeah. you know look decent, and then we say, let's put them on the ice with NHL prospects. Yeah, and I think the ones that we've covered earlier were ones to – kind of put the little initial buy and see how they do the rest of the week. and. So tomorrow on Thursday, we lather, rinse, and repeat. We have an on-ice practice, if you will, for each team, and then they also have an off-ice session. So um, we'll be seeing the same type of play tomorrow in terms of you know a very structured, coached, session for both sides and i think that's it for today we have uh we talked earlier to adam fox and matthew phillips so let's get to those interviews and we'll talk to you guys again tomorrow so this is dan and matt day one of uh the on ice session with adam fox adam you've been here before this is not new to you now what are you finding different about yourself in this camp you're feeling more comfortable yeah definitely a lot more comfortable you know coming back to see some familiar faces and you know kind of know what to expect coming in is definitely uh you know, it makes you feel more comfortable, and, uh, you know, I'm really enjoying it so far, you know, uh, seeing some of the guys from last summer and, you know, meeting some new faces, whether it be free agents or draft picks. So, you know, it's been a really good camp so far, and I'm excited for the rest of the week. Over the last year, what have you say is the biggest thing you've improved in your game? Uh, I think for me, I'm always trying to improve defensively, you know. Uh, obviously, I'm a guy that likes to get up in the play offensively and, you know, create chances, but... Obviously, when it comes down to it, I'm a defenseman, and uh, I think that's got to be a focus for me. So I think that's something I really improved on, you know, uh, playing college against, you know, older, stronger, faster guys. So uh, I think that's something I'm still trying to improve on going forward. For those that don't know, you have been playing college. What are you majoring in? Uh, I haven't picked yet, but, you know, still deciding. So we'll uh, we'll see next fall what I'm uh, majoring in there. Pick your major then. Yeah. Uh, with the Flames, on the, with their NHL team getting Hamannick and Stone, uh, and with uh, drafting Balamaki, uh, how do you feel about like the organization as a whole with their philosophy on defense, focusing on two-way defensemen and like how you fit in? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously they had some good signings and a good draft. So uh, obviously in the Western Conference going up, you know, McDavid and Dreisaitl a bunch of times, you, you got to have an emphasis on defense. And uh, I think they're really trying to focus on puck-moving defensemen, you know, I I think that's uh, somewhere I could fit, and you know I'm, uh, I'm excited to see you know where they see me and where they uh, see me being a fit here. Thanks for your time. Enjoy yeah. the rest of the week. This is friend of the show Ryan Pike, along with Dan and Matt from Fireside Chat, talking to Matthew Phillips, the Flames' 2016 sixth round draft choice. Like you know, it's, it's easy to sort of have a confidence boost of uh, being drafted. You know, it's obviously a nice uh, endorsement of your skills, but to uh, have the year you had in junior, I mean. 
one, one, now that the whole thing's over, like, was there anything that really stands out for you in terms of the, the whole last year or so, even even culminating in like the longest WHL game in history? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it feels good to, to kind of think that's been a year, and and I'm back here, and I know that I've gotten a bit stronger, and uh, another good season under my belt is as a confidence boost so it feels good to be here and, and it's fun to see new guys and, and yeah I think after the, the past season I think I gained a lot of confidence I played a lot more and, and we had some different situations like some some long long playoff games and, and stuff like that so it was good and, and I'm feeling pretty good coming in here. For you, I think you scored 51 goals? 50, right? Yeah, right on the dot. Right on the dot, right on the dot. I think there's only like a handful of guys that scored more than you in the entire league. For you, does that, I guess, give you a little bit more of a boost heading into what's potentially your last junior year? Uh, yeah, I guess a little bit. I think there was, there's a lot of really good players in the dub this year, so uh, there's a lot of teams that, that had some deep some deep teams, kind of like Medicine Hat, I think, had about eight 30 goal scores or something crazy, so I think, yeah, the offense was, was pretty good this year, but I'm pretty happy with kind of how I play for it every game. So I think, yeah, it's confidence, and hopefully I can be more of a leader going into my last year. Your experience in Stockton, did that sort of open your eyes in terms of what you want to work on to get that level and stay at that level full-time? Yeah, for sure. I was, it was pretty disappointing to, to lose out, but going out of Stockton was, was the perfect kind of silver medal to that. So it was awesome. I was there for a month, and, and I got to see firsthand how – how guys who are fighting for jobs work every day and, and approach the game. So I think it was good to not only play some regular season, but play in the playoffs and, and see a playoff series. So I think taking that and, and the level of play there, it just gives me a lot of confidence coming into a camp like this. When you and I chatted during the junior season, you mentioned sort of paying attention to what guys like Goudreau and Mangiapane were able to do at the higher levels to survive as a sort of smaller players. Did, 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 I guess did seeing Mangiapane firsthand, did it sort of help you sort of see things you want to do or adjustments you want to make in your game? Yeah, for sure. I, I think Mange is a guy that I think we play pretty similar games. I mean, and he's a couple years older, so he's a bit ahead, and he, he already had a year pro under his belt. And 20 goal score as a rookie is something that not a lot of people get to do. So he had a great year, and he's a perfect guy to kind of watch and, and model after. And hopefully I can kind of have another good year in Victoria and hopefully make the jump after that. What are the adjustments that you're looking to make in your game to take those next steps? Yeah, exactly. I think this year it's big that I'm going to need to kind of realize what works in junior and what doesn't, uh, what doesn't work at the pro level. So I think it gets a lot tighter up there. And, and it's a lot faster and there's not as much space to kind of hold on to the puck and wait and wait. So I think things happen a lot quicker. So I think that was perfect that I got to go to Stockton and get a taste of that because it just, the speed's the biggest thing that changes. So if you can adjust to that, then you'll make it a lot easier. I guess uh, going to World Junior Camp uh, at what, the end of, the, end of this month? Next, yeah, early next end month? Of July. That's, that's pretty, like, did you, were you surprised when you got the call or how, how is, uh, it must be, You've had a lot of confidence boost in the last year. It must have been a huge confidence boost to get Hockey Canada's approval. Yeah, obviously really exciting. I, I've never been to uh, any sort of Hockey Canada event, the U17 camp or anything like that. So I guess I was a bit surprised, but I think it's pretty cool. And, and there's 25 really good forwards that are going there. So it's going to be a battle for sure. But I think uh, that recognition feels pretty good. So it's something that uh, doesn't get to come around too often for a lot of kids. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty grateful for that. And hopefully I can go there and do my best and make a good impression and see what happens. Have you, uh, I guess, have your rep representation talked to the Flames yet, potentially about contracts? I know Dylan's already got a deal. A few other guys sort of are in the mix. Uh, are, are you, do you have that in your mind at all, or is that sort of something you're going to leave to other people? Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of something that I don't, I, I can control with my play. I can give myself a good opportunity, but I mean, overall, if I'm, if I'm just thinking about a contract, then it might not go too well. So I'm just trying to kind of work my hardest and go day by day. And, and you know, I got another year to hopefully earn a contract, so we'll see what happens and kind of hope for the best. Having the luxury of playing one more year in the WHL, what's the biggest thing you think you have to work on over the next season? Yeah, I think uh, being in the Duff for one more year um, at least is going to be it's going to be really good. And I'm it's a luxury in a way. Yeah, exactly. It's a chance for me to, to kind of get a get a top role and, and kind of be the go-to guy. So hopefully I can um, develop all around. So I think not only the offense, I think that's something that I'm always trying to work on, but I think being reliable at any point in the game, any zone, any part of the ice is something that I think uh, gives you a really good chance to play the pro level. So I think, yeah, the offense is something that comes and, and I work a lot at that, but I think if I can really focus on kind of rounding out my game and be more versatile for hopefully years to come. Is there, wrap it up here, sure. is there one thing that you saw during your time in Stockton where you go, I have to work on that one thing now going back to junior? Uh, I think it's just speed. I think I saw right away in the practice that 
things happen really quick and uh, there's not too much time, not too much space. So I think whether you're a big physical guy or a small skill guy, you need to do things quick and you need to think quick to give yourself a chance. Yeah. And we're back again. It's on ice day two, the third day in total of the uh, Flames Rookie Development Camp 2017 so far. And same group as yesterday. It's myself, Dan, alongside Matt, and Mike's here with us as well. Guys, we saw the same players on the ice today. These were the second on ice sessions, uh, Team Conroy and Team Jelena. I don't know about you, but I thought for the most part, and Matt and I talked about this, the first team in the morning usually looks like they have a bit more jump. The second team, not as much, but they've already been doing some off-ice training, so they're tired. Um, let's start with the question, did anybody notice any players today that they didn't yesterday, or were there any players that yesterday that maybe fell off today? Matt, why don't you start? I think that uh, in the Team Jelena group uh, from uh, the morning, uh, I think Zach Fisher and... Animalist Matson stood out more than they did yesterday. And I thought Mitch Renicky actually, one of the walk-on defensemen, he was fairly impressive with his skating ability. Uh, I noticed that a lot more than I did yesterday. And pretty much everybody else was more or less the same as they were yesterday. Mike, any thoughts you had about players? Yeah, for me, they were pretty much... Uh pretty consistent uh, from today to yesterday. Uh, in particular, there was one uh, one player on Team Conroy, though, who sort of uh, stood out to me today. Uh, and he's another walk-on, a guy named Glenn Godden, uh, number 80, who's a centerman. He had a, a lot of really good jump today, uh, good deflections, good uh, good skating, good... He just always seemed really engaged, something that I didn't really notice from him yesterday. We talked a little bit about Godden yesterday. He's a St. Louis Blues draft pick, unsigned, came to our camp. I would be very surprised if Godden does not at least get an AHL deal to stay in Stockton. I think that he's looking good. He's competing well for a walk-on guy, and I think that we'll probably definitely see him around this organization. Yeah, at the very least, an invite to Penticton and see at the minimum and go from there. Um, I thought it was interesting this morning. I don't know if you guys watched it for both teams, but they did a really interesting drill where the defensemen were actually shooting in on a screened goalie from the blue line. So they had a forward in screening the goaltenders, and the uh, the defensemen had to go in and block those shots. And it was interesting to see some of the defensemen who aren't really known for their shooting doing some really interesting stuff there. I thought that uh, Kale Dotzel was doing really well, and I also liked what I saw from Olus Matson on those ones. Uh, some hard shots, but there was a number of defensemen who were just kind of putting the hardest shot they could on and hoping it found its way to the net. And those guys, you could tell, were actually moving back and forth on the blue line a little bit more to aim it up and get it exactly where they needed it. So good to see a little bit more of that hockey sense and an interesting drill to watch. A line that I really liked today, which I thought was kind of an interesting pairing, was uh, this morning we saw Fu, Mangiapani, and Rajiska, number 15, 88, and 63 together. They were working quite a bit together in the uh, the first session today, the Team Jelena session, in a lot of different drills. And I thought that if you look at those three players, it's actually quite a good pairing. There's a little bit of everything there. And it wasn't just Fu dominating the scoring. He was doing a good job of moving that puck around too. So I really like that pairing. Yeah, and I think all three of those players contributed to the efforts in the practice drills. I don't think it, like there was one clear standout of the three each one, as you said, it was a mixed bag of different skills, but they were all contributing in each in their own way. And I'll be curious to see if the coaches put them together tomorrow for the scrimmage because I did think that line worked very well. Yeah, I mean, what, the Flames uh, haven't had a ton of chemistry with lines uh, in the big club the past year, so if they can f- foster some chemistry here, that's just all the better. I mean, they were three guys who seemed to really feed off of each other, and it would be interesting to see if it continues. Um, I noticed today, too, and I was saying it to Matt as we were watching the practice this morning, Matthew Phillips can really move well. Not just quickly, but just his movements are very fluid. He's not herky-jerky like a lot of these guys, and he can... I mean, you can tell he's a small guy just the way he skates. He's skating around guys and using his stick to move the puck around them. I don't want to say it's very Goudreau-like, but I think that's, for the average Flames fan, that's a lot of what that comparison is going to be. Yeah, very slippery. Actually, I'll compare him to a different player just so... uh, Pavel Datsuk, who is renowned for being just unbelievably elusive and you couldn't get the puck off of him. 
And because Phillips is so small, it actually helps because of the fact that he has better control of the puck and is able to do finer movements with it to avoid defenders trying to poke the puck off. When I was watching Phillips, his movements very much reminded me of Pavel Bure, or even, to a lesser extent, Val Bure. I mean, he just, I don't know, he plays... He, he it's a very smart... It's a smart game, but it's, it's what I'd almost classify a, a European style, like yeah. just the way he's moving himself around on that ice. So I know he doesn't have a ton of experience with European style, but that's just that was the first player that came to my mind. Is It's a different style than Goudreau, but similar in that they both know that they're small guys and they know how to use that. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see, because he is so small, that once he transitions to the AHL next year, can he adapt? And if he tears the cover off in the AHL and earns a call-up to the NHL, is he going to find that he's like Gaudreau and that he can handle it, or is there going to be a glass ceiling there? Yeah, and I mean, this is a guy who, you know, last year he played 70 games for Victoria of the WHL, got 90 points. The year before, he played 72 games and got 76 total points. So a guy who, at least at the junior level, is showing that he can produce. Now, we know that doesn't always translate to the NHL, but he has some obviously natural scoring talent there. Yeah, he's a very dynamic forward. Even a comparable that I would go to making is somewhat similar to Mike Camilleri because he ha- he has a really, really good shot, too, as well as being really small and shifty. I mean, you look at Matthew Phillips, and last year in the WHL, he scored 50 goals. And the Flames haven't had, like, a really pure goal scorer. Like, they have Monaghan, but on the wing since Mike Camilleri left. And Phillips is similar in stature and size to Camilleri, and I could see a f- uh, I could see him maybe in the future becoming a similar type of player. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting with the way the NHL is going and some of the problems we're seeing with Goudreau being so small would be managing two guys of that size in the same roster. And that's a problem, that, like, especially with Andrew Mangiapane as well, who's in that same height class. Like, if these players do show that they can play in the NHL, then what do you do? Like, do you have like each line having one of the the shorter players with guys like Furland and Kachuk partnering with them to make sure that they're protected? And I mean, you know, we always and, and I'm guilty of it too. But we as Flames fans always sort of look at our own assets as things, you know, guys that we want to see here. And just because they're good doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be a flame for us to get value from that too. We might say, you know what? We don't want another small player on the roster, but maybe Phillips or Mangiapane or any of those guys might be somebody that gets moved down the road yeah, to bring and, in an asset. And we saw that when the Flames moved out Paul Byron. I don't think they were wanting well, to Well, that was a waiver waivers, move. But, but yeah. you know, there was the calculus of, oh, well, we can't have Byron and Gaudreau. Well, so. they thought Ordeo wouldn't clear waivers too, which was part of it. And you look at the Flames last year, and they had two small forwards up front uh, on the wings. So they had Gaudreau and Chris Versteeg. And I feel like maybe uh, the Flames management might think that Versteeg is gone after this upcoming season, which might open open the door for one of these uh, smaller wing prospects to make the jump. Because they don't just have Phillips, they have Mangiapane, they, they have these guys who are sort of in the same height and weight class as Gaudreau and who could maybe take the spot of a Versteeg. I mean, in the past they've had Tange and Camilleri on the wings. They're, they're a team that's run with two smaller wingers before. Yeah, and I think it brings a different dynamic to the NHL. We see so many other teams, especially in our division, getting bigger. And, you know, big, tough guys. You're Keegan Kanzig and, you know, Hunter Smith type guys. So I think that that gives the Flames a little bit of a different flavor when you see them on the ice. And you also have to look at the team that's won the last two Stanley Cups, the Pittsburgh Penguins. They have two very short players in Jake Gensel and Connor Sheary both contributing significantly to their organization. And neither one of those players is very tall, but they're very skilled. So... It's one of those situations where with the new NHL, you can find success with shorter players if they are that good. For sure. Um, We talked a little bit about the forwards. Any other forwards that you guys specifically want to mention today? I just want to continue my uh, praise of Jeff Mallett. He had another good day today and uh, as a walk-on, and it'll be interesting to see if he gets signed. Especially for the Penticton tournament, they need bodies for that tournament. So I wouldn't be surprised if Mallet, if, um, you know, a few of these guys, but Mallet especially will probably get brought in there. Um, 
Yeah, there, there's a number. You know, Godden will probably get brought in there for sure. I thought uh, Ben Howarchuk also had a decent showing. I'm not sure if he's worthy of bringing to Penticton, but he was fairly decent as well. Looking at those guys, I'd probably bring Sam Dove McFalls before I'd bring Howard Chuck. For me, there were, uh, the guys, again, as I mentioned, were fairly similar to yesterday, but there was one, one player in particular who I didn't really have much of an expectation coming in, but I said it again, or I said it yesterday, but Emile Poirier uh, was not, he wasn't high on my, on my list of prospects coming into the camp. Yesterday he was impressive, and today he was even more impressive, to the point where I think he's the most seasoned guy on the, out on the ice, and uh, I mean, that would make sense considering that he's also the oldest guy out on the ice, but... I didn't even think he'd be a, even close to being a potential call-up for the Flames coming into this season. But right now, after this uh, camp, after these first two days, I think he might even be one of the first call-ups, uh, barring an injury. He's been really, really good. So. Well, I mean, if we look at, and Matt and I have talked about this in the past in the show, but if we look at the Flames' depth chart, they address goaltending, they address defense. What's the one position they're still looking for? Wingers. Specifically which side? Right. And Poirier plays on which side? Right. right. So I think that if nothing else, he and his representation may have sat down and said, you know what, it's now or never with this team. If you can't get back on the horse, you may fall too far down that depth chart. And being one of the older guys, now is that time, like you said, either to be the call-up or be the 15th forward or something like that. Yeah, and you look at uh, the Flames have been trying to address the right winger position. They, they drafted a couple this year. They added Spencer Fu. They had drafted a couple last year, like Tutuola. And, you know, it's just one of those situations that, like, if you're not putting up, you're going to get passed. And, like, while the Flames haven't utilized a top end draft pick, like a first rounder on a right winger, they have been trying to address it in other ways. And if Poirier does not step up and push to be in the NHL this year, I think his time may eventually run out in the He's organization. Well, we did the math. He's 24 now. 23. 23. So, And I think that especially for forwards, there's a, a past ripeness in the AHL. You don't see as much for defensemen. They can take longer to develop. Goaltenders take a lot longer. But I think for forwards, if you're not kind of moving up to the NHL by 24, 25 at the latest – you're kind of past your best before date, and you're probably going to stay in the AHL forever or not like get that's, tendered. Yeah, what you are is what you are. and Yeah, and that's like where, There's not really much more improvement beyond that. And that's where you start to see teams saying, you know what, do we want to re-sign this guy to a contract, or will we give that spot to a younger player coming up? So I think now, especially with Poirier not having a great season due to personal issues last year, um, if, you go to, if you haven't already, if you go to calgaryflames.com, there's some great interviews with him about – some of his addiction issues last year. But I think with coming back from that, now's that time to seize this and to show that he's ready to go and to move forward. Yeah, I had a chance to have just a little quick chat with Emil Poirier yesterday uh, as we were just uh, leaving the rink. And he just, he just seemed so happy and energetic to get back on the ice. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what he can do just from a personal standpoint because it's been such a great story. And, it, and there's an opening on the fourth line right wing or in the bottom six. I'm sure if he has a really good camp, he could step up and grab that spot. You had some thoughts about Poirier too, man. Yeah, in the past, uh, when we've because uh, we've seen him at, at each of the previous uh, development camps, he's not, not seemed like the happiest of people. And, like, this was, the, like, the first time I think I've ever seen him smile, even. And he seems genuinely happy, which, just on a personal level, that is a, a big sure. thing. And, you know, like, hockey doesn't matter. You know, like, it, as a person, you need to be in a good place. And he seems to be in a good place now. So, hopefully, that can continue just on a personal level, because... You know, nobody needs to lose that particular battle. The last note I had from today is looking down at the masked men uh, in this camp. We have Schneider, we have McDonald, and we have Parsons. One of them is definitely hand over fist better than the others. And I have to say that right now that's Tyler Parsons. He looks yeah. like he's ready to turn pro, no question. I think if he ends up going back to the OHL simply because they can't find room for him, it's poor asset management. Yeah. And I think he has to turn pro. He looks like he's ready to turn pro. Yeah, he's – if they send him to the OHL, it's a waste of an asset. And he's looking like he may even be ready for 
potential backup duty next year or the year after. Like, he is very impressive. It's like I was using a comparison, like seeing like guys like Mason McDonald and that being more like a third line forward type prospect, where Parsons is the Gaudreau type prospect, like just a different level entirely from the other guys. I know we talked a little bit about Mason McDonald yesterday in the show, and I really think that it's going to be interesting to see how he rises to the occasion with Parsons turning pro. I think that really, if you look going into last year, we had two pros. We had Gillies and we had McDonald. Riddich was just seen as a guy to back up on the AHL. Now I think there's no doubt Riddich is, you know, a goaltending prospect for this team. McDonald was a shoe in for the ECHL team last year, but I don't know if he is this year or if he is as a starter. So I'll be curious to see if McDonald can rise to the occasion to sort of try and put himself above Parsons for that job. Yeah, I mean, you always have to be you always have to be performing at your highest because who knows if there's a bunch of injuries in the organization and you get thrust into that role right away. Like the year we used 10 goaltenders? Yeah, Tyrone Gertner. Yeah, I mean... Andre Trefloff? Yeah, <laughs> Tyler Moss, yeah. But with, uh, with, with uh, Mason McDonald, I mean, he's clearly had a bunch of guys pass him on the depth chart since he was drafted in 2014, but... He he's looked good in camp for sure. Like it, he hasn't he hasn't stolen the show like Parsons, but he's looked steady. And like Matt said yesterday, he looks like he has NHL potential possibly. I, I think from a fan point of view too, Parsons is more interesting to watch. Parsons is more like a Kippersoft style butterfly goalie. Flops around the net, throws his legs up, makes more interesting saves. Oh, Parsons is a rock star in the crease. Like Where I think a guy like McDonald is more like a Hextall style stand up goaltender. He doesn't flop around as much. So it's not as interesting for fans to watch, but I really tried to isolate him today, and he's doing a good job of saving those pucks yeah, and cutting down uh, the angles. McDonald, he's more of a puck stopper than a goalie. Like he, he relies on his positional play, and it's a very boring style, but it's effective. Gets the job done. Yeah, uh, where Parsons is flash <laughs> and, you know, just amazing skill that he can throw out there. And it there's different ways of getting things done, and McDonald is showing that he can get things done. It's just, can he push himself so, hey, I'm better than Riddich, I'm better than Gillies, I'm better than Parsons. And that's the story that we're going to have to watch over the next 12 months, 24 months, even beyond, to see whether or not he can make those next steps to push himself towards becoming an NHL goalie. And I think the real fortunate thing the Flames have now is goaltending stability for a few years where you don't have to rush somebody into, oh, you know, Smith is leaving or Lack is leaving. Who's next? I think they've set themselves up that they can keep the Smith-Lack pairing as long as they need to until they feel somebody's good and ready. Yeah, it's not like you need to shove Gillies and Riddich as your starter and backup in the NHL this year. And yeah, or even saying we have no money next year, so we have Smith and whoever wins. You can just, I think, re-up Lack or re-up somebody like him for one year until you're ready. It's really amazing how far the organization has come in three years since Red Obera and Leland Irving were the were the one and two goalies. I mean, we have such a good we have such good organizational depth at this point where guys like those those guys are now the fifth and sixth goalies in the organization. So I think yeah, Smith and Lack are at the point in their careers where you can safely bank on being able to re-sign them for like one or two years after their current contracts expire. And it's a really good position to be in because there's really good guys below them too. And I think as an organization, we're looking at Smith and saying, we got him for two years and we need to have somebody ready, maybe not to take over the starting role, maybe someone like Lack transitions to the starter, but I think somebody needs to be ready to make a full-time NHL jump in two yeah, years. Yeah, and it also gives time to evaluate all three of the main prospects to see... Is any of them ready? And if they're not, then okay, we'll have to obviously go out and get somebody because you know the, the job's available. You know, you have two years to figure out which one of you is taking it. And if none of them do, then of course you'll have to go get somebody else. But that would obviously be the worst case scenario. For sure. Anything else about today you guys want to talk about? I'm good. Yeah, same. I'll be really interested tomorrow to see the scrimmage. To me, that's the best look at this talent that we can get because it's in a game scenario. And uh, we did talk to some prospects today. We'll play those after this, and we will talk tomorrow to recap the last day of the training camp. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks.
We're talking briefly with Dylan Dubé. So Dylan, we saw you a bit last year. Yeah. You're, you're back for a second camp. What do you feel is the biggest improvement you made in your game over last year? Um, you know, I think it's just confidence almost out of anything. I had that injury. I was able to build some strength, but uh, playing as an AC in the Western League, I had confidence and being able to take that from the World Juniors, I think um, it's not much difference from here from last year, but I think just being comfortable with everybody and not being nervous and kind of jiggling my stick You're more there. of a senior guy now than the junior guy? I could almost say that. I'm still only a second year here, but definitely it's uh, the first time you're here, you're kind of in awe of everything, and now I've kind of settled in. With your success being invited to Canada last year and likely going to be again, uh, what do you feel that you need to improve upon to just have a better overall season? I, it's tough for me. I, I haven't played a full season in a while. I think it was my 17-year-old year. I only missed four games or something. So, you know, right now I'm focusing on staying healthy. That's the biggest thing. But when you're out there, you can't control it too much. So I switched over here and had a great summer starting with the guys. We talked to arguably the most highly touted of the Flames goaltending prospects, Tyler Parsons, the 2016 second round selection. Day two of uh, on ice camp, you've got a lot of work this camp. We'll ask you from the other side, what are you thinking of some of the shooters that you're getting in this camp? Uh, the shooters are great. You know, you got guys coming from everywhere. You got guys coming from Europe and, uh, you know, guys coming from junior, college, you know, some guys returning from their HL seasons, uh, a lot of free agents. So. Um, you know, it's good. It's, uh, it's definitely, you know, in the summer you don't really, you know, when you're training in the summer and you're on the ice a couple times, you don't really get to see that, that high quality of shots. Sure. And uh, I think this is why uh, development camp is good. You know, it's, uh, you're not, it's not really uh, an evaluating camp, I'd say. It's more of, uh, you know, team building and get to know the guys and the staff and, uh, you know, get on the ice, get back in the groove of things. And, you know, there, there's going to be, uh, you know, some, you know, little rusty spots, but, you know, it's the summer. So, uh, you know, you're tr kind of focusing on training off the ice and, uh, you know, that, that on ice stuff will come towards August. Uh, with uh, a camp like this, because it is a little bit less formal, uh, does this give you an opportunity to try some things that you might not normally do in practice or in game situations? Um, no, not really. I think I think the biggest thing for me this camp is uh, you know working on the things that my uh, goalie coach Rob Liddell from back home uh, has told me to work on, and the goalie coaches here have told me to work on while I was in Stockton. So I think the biggest thing for me was just uh, being more patient and uh, you know trying to stay on my feet more. As a guy who's potentially turning pro this coming season. What do you think the biggest thing in your game you're going to have to elevate to that pro level is going to be? Uh, I, I think the biggest change in my game, like I said, would be, uh, you know, staying on my feet more. Um, you know, as you make that transition to pro, the guys are better with their skill. They have more patience with the puck. So I think the, the bigger body, body presence, I'm not a big goalie. So I think uh, the bigger I can make myself and, uh, you know, more patient I can be and outweigh those players, uh, that'll help me out. Uh, you were in Stockton for a couple weeks last year. Any big takeaways from Stockton from you know being with Gillies and Redditch and those uh, you know pro level goalies? Yeah, you know it's uh, you know I learned some things off them. Uh, you know they both have played played in the pro and uh, you know I took a couple tips off them and uh, you know even even some of the older players there. Uh, you know just you know being being in the hotel. You know a couple guys live in the apartment upstairs on the on the hotel and you know going up there and just. Having you know, having a couple of talks with them, and uh, you know, guys have been playing pro for a couple of years now, and have been on a couple of different organizations. You know, hearing hearing stuff from them really, uh, you know, really makes you think about uh, you know your career and uh, things you can do and to help you out further down your career. In your uh, draft year, of course, you won the Memorial Cup with London, and then last year you had a very impressive run in the playoffs. How did you feel? being in those high pressure situations because I, I, I know in that Erie series like your team was getting pet, you were getting peppered <laughs> with yeah. plenty of shots and it's uh you know I think it's good for me uh, early in my career to you know go through you know an M Cup uh winning in overtime and uh you know World Juniors going into a shootout so I think uh I think it was really good for me to to uh you know experience those things early in my career so you know later down the road when those things happen again uh you know I'm ready for it I know how to take it on New pads look great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you notice still a white uh, helmet. Any any ideas of what you want to put in your mouth? Uh, I'm not sure. I know. I know. I'll probably throw the, the big flaming C on top of it. But uh, sure. You know, I, I I'm not sure uh, what I'll put uh, on the sides of it yet. But uh, you know, I'll probably figure that There's out in the cool next month. a lot of to work with. Oh no, yeah. Oh well, yeah. Thanks for your time. Yep. No worries. Thank you. This is Dan and Matt on day two of uh, Flames on Ice sessions, and we're here with one of the newest Flames, Adam Rujishka. Adam, first off, welcome to Calgary. Is is this your first time in the city?
Yeah, that's my first time yeah. here. And what are you thinking of it so far? Oh, it's pretty nice. We've been uh, at the downtown yesterday. We've been cooking in a cooking competition yesterday. So You're going to the Stampede this weekend, I imagine? Oh, yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. So for fans that don't know you, what can you tell them about your game? Who might you be comparable to? Uh, uh, about initial players or... Uh, yeah, anyone that regular Flames fans might know. I mean, uh, Malkin is pretty similar. Uh, I love his uh, kind of hockey sense I want to play. Uh, kind of same style like him, but I want to take uh, put my things in there. So yeah, that's, that will be pretty much it. So, uh, how did you find transitioning from being in Europe to coming to Canada last year? Oh, I mean, uh, it's smaller rink, it's everything's faster, higher. So, I mean, it took a pretty kind of long time to adjust, but I'm fine now and I'm enjoying it. Coming into a camp like this, I know that the coaches are working with you guys on a lot of things you might need to work on or things to improve on over the year. What do you think is the biggest thing over this next season you're going to have to improve? Uh, compete. Uh, just compete higher and uh, everything would come uh, easier way. Everything would be uh, easier for me. Uh, practicing, uh, playing, uh, playing games. Just turn up the level a little bit? Yeah, just turn up the level because everyone's want to play in NHL, so I mean, like, they have a pretty high level, so that's why. And you're probably seeing that too with guys on this ice at this camp who've played pro. You can probably see a little bit of that difference between the guys who have and haven't in the level. Oh, yeah, I mean, they have uh, experiences before, so I mean, uh, they're pretty pretty good guys which are showing us how to do it, so I mean, it's pretty good for us. Exactly. Uh, with the Flames uh, being in a more win now situation, uh, how do you feel about being in an organization like that for a team that's more of like a rebuilding situation? I mean, uh, it's a perfect spot for me. I, I, I think uh, to be drafted in uh, second place in the draft year by the Flames, it's amazing. And uh, it's a uh, kind of dream come true. I just have to work hard and uh, hopefully I'm going to play on the show We're looking forward to see how you look in the scrimmage tomorrow. Oh yeah, I'm looking forward to it and uh, I'm kind of knowing my teammates and line mates right now. I'll tell so. you right now, the small arena is going to be packed. It is every year. So oh yeah, that's You'll get to see your first good. taste of the Sea of Red. That's pretty good. All right, well like thanks it. a lot. Yeah, good luck this guys. season. Well, day three is over at training camp, and we are back in the studio recapping after all the on-ice festivities have happened. Today was probably the most fan-friendly day, and as always, it was packed in there. There's probably, what, two, 300 people, Matt? Oh, more than that. More like 500 or so. Like, people were sitting in the stands. They were standing all around the rink. Today was the Team Red versus Team White scrimmage. And... I think the most notable thing to me in the scrimmage was the low score. Usually in years past, we've seen like, you know, 8-9, to 11-12. to 12. This year was a 4-1 to one scrimmage. So there was a lot more, a lot less scoring and a lot more, you know, puck possession game and passing game. And I found it a lot more exciting to watch because of that. Yep. Um, going through this, we don't. The rosters were pretty much what was on the website, pretty much what had been mentioned in the past. The Jelena Conroy team rosters. Um, was there anyone that really stood out for you in the scrimmage? I'd have to go with uh, Oliver Shillington, uh, both in a positive and negative light. Yeah, how, how so in a negative light? Well, his decision making at times he would overcommit and it allowed the opposition to get a good scoring chance it, it offensively he's as dynamic as ever and like if you're just keeping him in the nhl as an offensive player i think he could stick right now it's just trying to get him to be a little smarter with picking his spots defensively I'm not sure that uh, he's NHL ready because of that problem still manifesting, and I'm not even sure if it wouldn't be a better idea down the road to try him as a forward because he does have enough offensive skill that he would be a top six forward. Yeah, I just think that right now the forward ranks are so crowded that adding another guy in there might not be the best idea. But he, they could definitely try it. Um, what did you think of the other senior defenseman in Rasmus Anderson? Solid but unspectacular. Just he did his thing and that was it. 
I think this proved to me that both guys probably still need some time to work in the AHL. Yep. The defenseman that I really liked in this, uh, especially from an offensive perspective, was number 68, Adam Olis Matson. I thought that Olis Matson was doing a lot of the right things. He was really invested in the play from a, an offensive perspective as a defenseman. He really stood out well to me, and I'm excited to see Olis Matson hopefully um, coming over and playing more in North America. Yeah, then it's just a matter of finding a spot for him. His skating has improved significantly. It still needs to get better, but it's not holding him back. And he's just a very intelligent player. Just have to see if he can take those next steps. In this scrimmage, I think probably the... And everyone's seen it on Twitter and Facebook and stuff, I would imagine, a million times by the time this episode comes out. But the um, Fu and Parsons interactions, we had... Parsons stone Foo once, and then Foo get a puck past Parsons, both of which were pretty spectacular. I heard some fans saying to me after the scrimmage that um, they thought Foo was NHL ready after this. What do you? What are your thoughts? I wouldn't go quite that far yet. Um, he's good. I just don't think he's. You need to stick him in the NHL right now, and I think he'd be perfectly fine to get another few months like january february in the a and or if injuries and see how things go then yeah talking to Fu, he said that he feels his game is more complete now he thought that he was just really a you know a shooter or a sniper last year and he thinks that he's rounded out his game so i think he's probably right in that assessment i think that yeah like you're saying january february i'd even be okay to leave him in the a all year yeah so would i I don't think there's any reason, especially, you know, in our last episode, we talked about the roster that's on the flames, especially on the forward side, and that there's not a lot of holes. So I just don't know where you would slot Fu in right now unless he takes someone's job that would make it more advantageous than going to the AHL. Yeah, uh, he'd basically have to play at a level that, like, he would have to take that first line right wing spot in training camp and i just don't see that materializing from what i saw of him no i mean he's you can tell that there's a guy who has played you know u.s college hockey just he has some stuff that he needs to iron out there yeah and plus the fact is that he's only ever played like 40 games a year and going from that to an 82 game schedule you know getting him used to Playing more would be better, I think, and having him in the A would do that. And that's even something that you and I talked to Johnny Goudreau about a few years ago when he made the jump from college, and he said that, yeah, you know, he's probably going to want to, um, you know, do some more conditioning than he's used to because he's going to have to play so much. So that's definitely a big jump there that Foo's going to have to see how he adjusts to because going from 40 to 82 games – playing almost double the season if he jumps right to the NHL Mm -hmm. because our division in the A plays what 60 some yeah I think yeah something like that so that's not as big a jump um looking at this team the Flames did as they usually do they did a period and then a shootout and then a period and a shootout guys who we expected to score scored you know we saw Fu score we saw Valimaki score but I thought it was interesting there was a lot of the walk-on guys who I thought looked the best in the shootout and in the game even if they didn't necessarily score guys like Godden, Bush, uh, Russell, McKay a lot of these guys who you know I think realize that they're here trying out and vying for that spot and in the past, you and I have said that we've always been able to really tell the walk-on guys from the guys under contract. And this year, I think those lines blurred a lot more. Yeah, and I think that also adds to the, fa- adds to the fact that we didn't have guys like Gaudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, Bennett, uh, guys like that, or even, even lesser guys like Poirier and Klimchuk. You know what I mean? Like We didn't have extensive upper end depth where you could clearly see that oh these guys are better than those guys and it you know it, we're dealing mostly with our lower end depth guys that if they pan out will be fourth line players versus uh, you know if they pan out they'll be stars so uh 
the top end has dropped in this camp, whereas before the top end, you could clearly see that certain players were well above everybody else. Like a guy like yeah. a guy like Matthew Phillips last year was not as noticeable as he was this year, and he looked decent, but you could tell that a guy like Matthew Kachuk was clearly better, and. Phillips was well, probably part of this, the. We're not looking for stars right now either. We're really looking for Forge to fill out a bottom six. Yeah, and, but then you have a camp like this where Phillips stands out as being like, "Oh wow, this guy might actually be an NHL player," but he might, <laughs> but he probably won't. And it, you know, because the, the upper end talent at this camp is not as good as it was. Yeah, and, you know, we're not looking for that big star. We're not looking for that guy to fill out our top six. We have those positions pretty much all established now. No one from this camp is going to do that. Um, the biggest name probably coming in here that Flames fans know, and we've talked about him in the last couple of days, is Valimaki, uh, the Flames' first-round pick this year. And even that pick, I think, is going to be Yusuf Valimaki. He's going to be, you know, probably two, three years out before we see him playing in the NHL. Yeah. He's almost like Jankowski on the defense. Yeah, and honestly, I'd expect like when the Stone, Hamannick, and Brody contracts are up in three years, that's when you'll see him getting in. Like I'm expecting that uh, Shillington and Anderson will either be out of the organization or in the NHL by then. So, it, it, you know, by then Valimaki and probably a guy like Fox will be the ones that'll be champing at the bit to the, take spots. Another player I noticed who was probably the grittiest player on the ice here was number 71, Hunter Smith. Um, I think with Kanzig out of the organization now, Smith is going to be looked at as primarily that big nasty guy, especially as a guy who's already playing in the A. And Smith seemed to be playing a lot more physical than a lot of people in this game. So that was nice to see from him. I think Smith, I don't project him as NHL, you know, even an NHL depth player at any point in his career, but it's good to know that we've got that guy in the organization. So between Gadzik and him, we're going to have that toughness in the A. Yep. Um, Matt, any other... We'll let people go and read. We'll put all the scores into the show notes for this show if you want to see who scored, who didn't score in the shootouts. Um, any other skaters you want to talk about? Um, Anyone that was noticeable for good or for bad? I thought Dylan Dubé had a good game. I think he was probably one of the best forwards. Yeah, uh, I agree. Other, I other think... than that, like everybody else is just kind of varying degrees of their... I talked to Treliving afterwards during the media availability, and he reminded us that it's tough to evaluate players during hockey in July. He reminded us that this really isn't about evaluating these guys for you know the season. This is really about getting them out there, getting them learning good habits, working with them and developing a little bit, and that we really cannot evaluate these players until we get to main camp in September. Yeah. He did tell us there's probably three or four guys that'll be coming to the Penticton tournament based on this. But even that, I mean that doesn't mean you get invited to main camp or not. Yeah. It's just checking the pulse and seeing how things go and like did this player exceed my expectations? Did he disappoint? Does he have things to work on? Sort of like Anderson previously needing to work on his conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So you know, we'll see back in September and, you know, figure things out with a better idea of how things are. And I think for, you know, a lot of this, really what they want these guys in for was the off ice, the bonding, the, you know, cooking classes they did, the, you know, social media stuff. This was really just a chance to have the organization give an early look at these guys and then give them some things to work on before September. And that's really going to be the test is, did you do what you were told to do when you come back at the main camp? Before we sign off, let's just talk a little bit about the goaltenders then. Uh, Parsons, I thought, definitely looked like the best goalie here. I don't want to say he's NHL ready because he's not. I think he's still... You know, a very young goalie, very raw, and still has some work to do. But between Schneider and McDonald, did you see much difference? I did. I thought Mason McDonald was better uh, than he has been over the last few years at these camps. Uh, he actually looked like a quality prospect 
the, the to me he looked like a guy who's played pro hockey yeah and a guy that you could possibly envision being in the nhl someday whereas like the last few times it's like i eh, don't know <laughs> so yeah i yeah. think the last couple of years mason has looked the most disappointing of the goalies yeah and now he looks just solid not great but just decent See, and there's a few shots I saw in this where you could tell that a, a player coming from junior was trying to do something you'd get away with, ju in, with in junior, and Mason wasn't giving in. He wasn't falling for it. And I think a lot of that just speaks to having a year of ECHL hockey under his belt. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, you know, overall pretty good. Um, nice to see. Great to see the support in July. Good scrimmage. Lots of compete. I was glad that there was that much support in July. Um, I don't think there's anything else to talk about as far as the scrimmage goes. Anything you want to say, Matt? No, just it was a decent event overall. and Good week overall in, in general. Very different feel this year. Yeah, I think that part of it goes hand in hand with the fact that the Flames are now in contender mode. That this almost becomes more of an afterthought in some ways. Like It's important, but it's not... Like, oh, we need these guys to figure things out so that way we can have an NHL team someday. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, and when we as the media spoke to True Living after the scrimmage, he said to us, you know what, we are missing some key draft picks for the next couple of years, you know, our firsts, our seconds, our thirds. So he said that these camps are going to be more about finding talent to replace those players that we lost. Yeah. Finding that talent to say, you know, we're expecting seven or eight new players into the organization every year. If we're not drafting them, we're going to be spending more time looking at undrafted free agents going forward in these camps. Yep. So it's going to be very different. I mean, I think this year is we saw it already that it's a different flavor than the past. And I think this is the flavor we should expect going forward is a lot more sort of i don't want to demean them but sort of lower end prospects in the organization and a lot more um you know walk on guys yeah and that's not to say that like the you won't see players actually making the nhl out of this camp like that i'm sure that a, a good portion of them will it's just not to the same extent as years gone by like we're looking more at like the 2006 type development camps where you had guys like Eric Nystrom, Dustin Boyd, and David Moss being the highlights. Yeah, I think if we look at this camp and these players is trying to fill out our bottom six. Yeah. And I mean, the best player hand over fist was Emile Poirier, but he's also the oldest guy here with the most experience. Definitely. And we just have to wait and see and like see how this season goes for each of the guys that are in the organization and go from there. And I think that with a bunch of the walk-ons, they were trying to lay the foundation like they did with Fu a few years ago and try to get them excited about becoming a flame. And especially if the flames have on a success this upcoming year, then like we start to become a destination where teams want to go to, players want to go to that organization and will sign as a college free agent because hey you know they're good and they're going to need to open spots up so i can just walk into the nhl so you know just things like that and it'll be important especially on the pro side of it for the team to be as good as possible so as to be able to entice players to come and you know it's a self-fulfilling pros prophecy basically the better you are the more players want to come so then that that the more good you'll be overall and it just keeps feeding itself well i think that's something that the fans don't realize i mean let's look at foo because you mentioned foo foo's an edmonton native yeah he's a kid who's born and raised in edmonton but chose to come to calgary rather than go to edmonton who was also in on him. and Who was also in on him. And, and also teams. had a need for a right winger like we did. And yet he chose here. And I think part of that is because the Flames brought him in last summer. They showed him hospitality. They showed him what a great organization it is. And you're right. I think a lot of this is a recruiting tool more than anything. It's let's bring him in. Let's show him the stampede. Let's you know give him the tools they need. Let's 
show them what a great organization we are. So when it comes down to us versus your hometown team, you might pick us. Yeah. So I think we have to remember that too when we're looking at, you know, why are the Flames bringing some of these guys in or why are they bringing in so many guys? This is a recruiting piece. It's not like the draft where you get taken by the Flames and like it or not, your Flames property. These kids can choose to go to any team that makes them an offer or none of them. They don't have to sign a contract. So it becomes that way to, to yeah, show them, okay, this is what we can do for you. Yeah. So I think, I don't know about you, Matt, I think that's pretty much all we have to say about the scrimmage. I agree. And we will talk to everyone, geez, unless the Flames make a big trade or something, we'll probably talk to everyone in late August as we gear up for the season. Thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our coverage of the development camp. And we're both just looking forward to seeing some good hockey this season. And hopefully the Flames come out of the gates good and can just, you know, be the best team in the West and just, you know, we're ready to vie for the cup. So let's go. It's going to be a good season. I think both looking more at this roster now than last show, I think both the NHL and the AHL are going to be exciting to watch for the Flames this year. I think Stockton's really going to be competing as well. So let's sign off. Let's let everyone enjoy their summer. And uh, I know we don't want to talk too much hockey in July. Let's go enjoy this 30-degree weather that we're having. And we'll talk to everyone late in August. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.